another episode of Alma Ensemble Summer Interview Series. We've got Sarah Wardle Jones with us. Hi. Erica Sipes. Hello. And I am Michelle Smith Johnson, and we are the co founders of the Alma Ensemble, a chamber music collective based in Roanoke, Virginia. So we are so excited today to have Noelle Anderson with us. She's a board certified music therapist, a speaker, children's book author, entrepreneur, business owner, and on and on and on and on. Incredible human being. Thank you for being here, Noelle. We're happy to have you. How are you? Much. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm, I'm doing well, as well as I can right now, I suppose, <laughs> being locked in my house for a couple of months. But yeah, doing well. Well, it's good to see you, Noelle. <laughs> good to see you too. I miss yeah. seeing you in person. I know, I know. We know each other through different projects that we've done in Roanoke. Um, so I wanted to start out by just talking about your career. You do a bunch of diverse different things, but it's all centered around music therapy. Mm -hmm. And as musicians, and I think most people who experience music know how powerful it can be, but um, music therapy leverages it in a really specific way. So could you, for people who might not know, just talk a little bit about what music therapy is and how you came to pursue it as a career? Yeah, sure. So uh, music therapy really uses the different elements of music specifically to meet therapeutic goals. So for example, if we're working with someone who um, had a stroke, we might use music and, and the, the melody and the rhythm specifically to help them produce words, to help them um, maybe recall words. For someone with a brain injury, we might help them uh, with the way that, as you know, music is very structured, it's very repetitive. So we can help teach them strategies if they're having a hard time with memory problems, um, as is pretty typical with people with a traumatic brain injury. Um, if we're working with someone Maybe with autism, we might work on um, communication skills or some like pragmatic skills, which are unwritten social rules. Like when someone smiles at you, typically you smile back. Um, and so we might sit at the piano and have an improvisation and use that as a way um, to interact and to have really a nonverbal um, communication. So we just, we happen to use music um, purposefully in a way that meets all different goals, depending on who we're working with. Uh, as far as like how I got into this, <laughs> is that, was that the question? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I actually started as a music ed major. And when I did my observations, I was like, oh, this is not for me. So <laughs> I was like, I do not like kids, which is <laughs> ironic because now I work largely with kids. Um, but I just realized I didn't like it in that context. So uh, I Googled careers in music, and that's the first time my sophomore year of college that I found out about music therapy, had never heard of it before. Um, and thanks to Google, that's what I do today. <laughs> Well, and you must have found something that like resonated with you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's really what kind of the definition I found on Google was um, a mixture between using music for like counseling, psychology. And in high school, I was trying to decide if I wanted to do psychology or music. So, um, so it was like perfect because I never realized I could do both at the same time. That's so awesome. Well, oh, that's so wonderful. So you took that obviously got your degree, got board certified, and then you founded and now run your music therapy practice, Anderson Music Therapy. Did you always know that you wanted to start your own practice? Um, and what did you learn from starting your own business from scratch? Yeah, so I didn't, I never had really planned to start my own business. Um, it just kind of happened like most of the things in my life. Um, I used to work in a school for kids with disabilities and did music therapy full time there um, in New Jersey. And then when we moved here, I couldn't find any music therapists there. I just I couldn't find them. So the first thing I did, of course, was start a Facebook group for music therapists and found that there actually were some here and they were like just hiding all around. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but there really there wasn't a private practice in Roanoke. I was like, what? Like at, coming from Philadelphia area. 
where there's a ton, it just, it floored me that there was not really a resource for music therapy here um, privately. So that's pretty much that first week I moved here. I made a website and <laughs> started, started my practice that first week uh, that I moved here because I couldn't find anyone. I was like, okay, we, we have a need here. So we're just, we're going to try to fill it and see what happens. And um, as far as what I learned was that it's really hard. <laughs> it's very hard to run your own business and it's starting from scratch. Um, you, you learn this a lot you don't know and um, that there is so much to know and you will never know all the things. <laughs> you're, you're always learning and you're always um, I just kind of learned by trial and error, a lot of error <laughs> and just, you know, kept, kept like, okay, that didn't work. And I'm still, you know, partly doing that. But I think in a lot of ways I learned probably way too late that, um, it's really important to be, to, to meet people that, um, have had a practice and to learn from them. And so whenever people come to me like this last week, I had a probably an hour conversation with a music therapist, um, out in California. I don't, ironically, we have, I think we went to temple at the same time, but we didn't realize it until like we were almost done our conversation. Um, but you know, I just had a conversation with her cause she's starting a private practice and like, there's just so much to know. And it's like, well, where do I start? And, um, I just want to help support people in, that those beginning steps because it is not it is not easy in beginning middle or I'm sure end hopefully I'm not there right now but <laughs> yeah um, absolutely and that information can be so powerful especially coming from you know like you said trial and error but that's how we as humans I don't know I think the best lessons are learned that way and for you to pass on that information to the to the woman who's starting her practice I think that's wonderful I'm sure that was amazing for her too I hope so. <laughs> so I have a question of kind of piggybacking on that, Noel. So when you moved here, if there weren't any music therapists in Roanoke, does that mean part of your job too was to educate potential clients and that type of thing about music therapy? Was mm -hmm. that just something that people didn't know about here? I feel like for the first four years, maybe, of my practice, like it was just constantly educating and I did since the time I've moved here I've lost count of how many presentations and things that I've done because it's just it, yeah it's been just educating and that's been a large part of people understanding the power of music therapy um, just educating and sharing what what we do you know that we're, um, we're we're not entertaining we're using music for you know therapeutic purpose Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's an interesting that when you said that you're not entertainment, mm -hmm. I bet that would just be such a difficult thing for a lot of people to understand. Yes. Yeah. Cause, <laughs> I mean, cause it can, cause it can look like that sometimes uh -huh. um, when we're doing, you know, a sing along or um, leading a, uh, you know, a popular song or something, it can look like entertainment, but in our head, we're seeing so many things in our participants and we are thinking of the goals of each individual, whether that's something with their fine motor or something with, um, like I said, with communication. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, it's just, it's more of like the thought process. Even though you spent a short amount of time on the music education trajectory, I'm sure that helped a lot too, um, because um, it obviously in a different capacity, but I, I, that resonates because when I see a student, I teach middle school orchestra, mm -hmm. so when I, and, and the fourth and fifth grade strings as well. So when I see a child have an issue with that mm -hmm. fine motor movement, like we work with that, and, yep. and then you see that improvement and you're always scanning for those types of improvements. That's really cool. And I hear that you've written a children's book that sort of blends, um, you know, story, but it also involves music. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And how did you go about putting that together and finding an illustrator, all that? Yeah. Um, so I've, 
I love writing. I don't do it very much anymore, but um, but it's just something that I've enjoyed through my life, and I always wanted to write a book, but just never sat down to do it. And one day, I was like, "Okay, I've had this thought in my head for a long time. I'm just gonna put it on paper and see what happens." So, so I did, <laughs> and I actually found um, the illustrator on Fiverr. If you're familiar with that website. It's basically you could pay anybody to do something for like five dollars um, and you know I paid her more than that but <laughs> that's the starting price um, but she was uh, I wanted something like a watercolor and like I had the thought in my head of how I wanted the illustration to look and she just completely brought it to life of what how I wanted it to look um, so the book is called a kid's guide to relaxation and sleep and so it uses, it teaches parents and kids specifically what kind of music is appropriate for relaxation and sleep. Um, because some of the marketed lullabies are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, if you've ever heard those ones, they're just like, bling, blong, 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 you know? <laughs> it's like, that is not relaxing. And that is not what a lullaby really is. Like, a good lullaby has very small steps, so there's nothing surprising. You don't want the volume to jump up and down. Like you want it to be very same volume. Um, you, I, for sleep, you actually don't want to have any music that is rhythmical because that keeps the brain alert and awake. So almost all the lullabies out there that are like, buy this for your kids, might be good for calming them down, but it's not actually going to be good for sleeping. So um, I go through all that in the book, but the the actual um, story of the book is written in a social story format, which uh, for individuals with autism, they're probably familiar with that. Um, it's just a really basic concrete way to explain, like sometimes I the story goes like sometimes I don't want to sleep I might be thinking about my toys um, but I don't have to be anywhere else right now I can be stay in my bed and um, I could play with my toys tomorrow you know and it's just very very concrete um, and throughout the story it teaches how to use deep breathing to calm your body down and of course the very first page tells you to put on some music and, <laughs> and so you put on the music and you do the deep breathing. Um, and I wrote a song to go along with the book because we know when, when there's music uh, connected with lyrics, they get stuck in our head. And so I wrote the song to remind kids um, of the steps, the steps that they should take when they're trying to calm down and get ready for bed. That is That's, so beautiful. Is, I just put it in my cart. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did, I did, I was reading the reviews and one of them said, this is great for adults too. I use it myself or something like that. <laughs> yeah, all the concepts, I mean, they really are transferable to adults as well because all the, you know, selecting music for sleep, like all that's gonna be similar. Um, with the, you know, not having rhythm and keeping things that aren't going to keep our brain alert are going to help our brain feel calm and safe and grounded. So. That's great. I'm going to go get yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had had it when our daughter was a baby. <laughs> and that's what, when I became a parent, I was like, oh my goodness, nobody told me how hard the sleep thing is. And so that's why that, I, my plan is to have a series of books, but that's why that was the first one. Because I was like, whoa, this is the hardest part of parenting, at least in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that whole sleep thing. So I wanted to give parents tools to, at least one tool in their toolbox to help kids calm down and, and get some sleep and their parents get some sleep. That's great. Um, you have also participated in live storytelling. Um, so I think Roanoke has a group called the Hoot and Holler, yeah. um, but there's live story to, I, I wasn't familiar with it until we started talking about it, except I think like the moth radio hour is something similar. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So that's super fascinating. How, 
how did that come about? And um, what was that experience like? Yeah, so I, I think like most things in my life, it just, somebody called me out of the blue and I was like, okay, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, Lee, she's the head of, uh, she started that. Um, she has a background in, in movies and uh, working in Hollywood and stuff, I think. And so she started that um, hoot and holler in Roanoke and uh, it was in October and they were doing, they always, always do a theme. So they were doing a theme on magic. And she said, uh, you know, I think sharing the magic of music would be such a cool like thing to do. So I was like, yeah, okay, I can do that. Um, and I'll tell you what I, like I said, I've done a ton of presentations and all that, but I was so nervous. I have not been that nervous. I can't even remember when, like I was so nervous <laughs> and just there was, the audience was full. It was at the Grandin Theater, um, just a packed house and the energy was so great, but it also gave me anxiety. <laughs> sure. Um, so just like, so like just such a high energy. Um, <clears throat> and all the other storytellers as well, all the stories were so diverse, but there was just this really neat common thread of connecting with people. Um, and I think, I, sorry, I'm like feeling a little sad right now because of just so many, the loss of the connections right now with, with COVID-19. Um, but there was just this really common thread of connection. And that was kind of the heart of my story was, um, music gives us a place to, to connect and to belong, even whether we're completely non-speaking or we're, we're speaking, like it bridges that gap, um, for people of all different abilities. And, um, and that was what, you know, the magic that I shared of music there and that it was just a fantastic experience. So do you think you would do it again? Oh, it was really nerve wracking, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I would, if, if she asked me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think I'll be like volunteering, but, <laughs> but it was a really great experience. That's great. So uh, in your work, and we can talk pre-COVID and post-COVID, yeah. um, <laughs> yes. what, what are the best aspects of your work and what are the most challenging? So um, how do you celebrate the good and um, sort of process and sort of move on from the difficult. I, I often have high schoolers contact me and say, I'm thinking about going to music therapy. And, um, you know, they want to ask me questions and stuff. And um, I always say, if you are not ready to advocate for yourself and your career every single day, <laughs> then don't do this. Um, because that is the most challenging thing is... Um, sometimes not being recognized for the research behind what we do, um, for the validity behind what we do, for you know, people thinking that we're purely entertainment, which also can be therapeutic in its own right, um, but people don't always understand the difference. And so sometimes that can be exhausting, having to explain that, um, or being written off immediately um, without people without having the chance to even explain that. I think that's probably one of the most difficult things. Of course. Um, it was something that, that can, continues to fuel my passion and encourage me. Um, it's just seeing my, my clients when they are empowered to grow, um, especially hearing from parents when they share stories of something new that their child has done um, seeing, you know, new communication, being able to, to say, I love you to them, or, you know, sing, they can sing a song when they can't normally speak a whole lot of words, you know, just seeing the parents light up and being able to be a part of that, that, that keeps me going, um, even when it's, you know, difficult otherwise. Of course. That's wonderful and so beautiful. Thanks. And I kind of have a question that yeah. piggybacks on that too. And that is because I'm sort of an entrepreneur. I'm trying to be an entrepreneur, but okay. 
I, I've tried this much of my life and I keep <laughs> chickening out. So I'm trying to glean some inspiration from you here. Um, what do you, like you've said that there are, there are points where you are going to make mistakes mm -hmm. and you're going to do things that are not going to work. Like for me, it is so easy to just say, I can't, I don't know where to, I don't know what, where to turn now. I don't know what to do. Okay. I'm going to do something else. Mm -hmm. I give up very easily, but you obviously don't. So what is your magic ticket? <laughs> what's, what's, what keeps you going and going back mm -hmm. and determined to keep doing what you want to do? Yeah. I mean, there's so many, so many things there. Um, so one thing I've learned the hard way, I think, um, is don't, I try not to comp compare my now to someone else's future. And what, what I mean by that, and I probably haven't said it in the best way, but like other people who are, who are, I view as more successful than me, they've been doing this for a long time. Like I can't compare where I'm at to somebody else who has been growing their business for longer than me, or isn't even if they're like in a bigger city than me, like it's, you just can't compare. Um, I think it's really important and I need to do this more, but to write down like when I have things that I consider successes, I guess, um, because it's so easy to forget those and so easy to remember the mistakes. Um, but if like I have a really good friend who reminds me of how far I've come because I, I will forget and she's like but you've done this and that and that I'm like oh yeah I guess yeah yeah I guess you're right <laughs> <laughs> you know it's so it, we're the hardest on ourselves yeah so um sometimes thinking of it from like outsider perspective a change can change the way that we view what's going on and you never know if you don't don't try you know try the do whatever, whatever you want to do. Um, so just try and learn and, and grow each step. That's very helpful. <laughs> well, and I think it's, if you need more. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Let's see, where's my list of films? <laughs> I think it's so important for kids to hear too. And I think even music students and music therapy students in school, because like you said, I think you know, when you're in training and you're in school, you are constantly comparing, plus you're getting graded and all that. And so I think when you leave school and that world, you can carry that into your professional world. And maybe that's not ideal. So maybe it's important to really like take off that hat. And you're still a student, but in a different way. It's for yourself, you know. So yeah, thank you for those thoughts. Yeah. Well, and that's a common theme that we've seen sort of this the path is never going to be what you think it's going to be. Um, and, you know, uh, Noelle, you've echoed those things with, like, starting your own business and, you know, moving here and realizing that there is a need mm -hmm. and what a cool way to contribute to our community in that way. Thank you. Amazing. Yeah. Music therapy people are the best people. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, like, <laughs> truly. <laughs> the, the best folks I know are music therapists. They're the most humble too. Yes. Yeah. That's pretty cool. The formal part of the interview is over. Okay. And we're going to move on <laughs> to some shenanigans <laughs> with the graphic portion. Awesome. Okay. So, yeah, Sarah, you're up. All right. So um, you, it sounds like you, you kind of delve into a bunch of arenas already, but... If time and money were no object, what hobby would you love to try that you just haven't done yet? I mean, when I was in undergrad, the only fun class I got to take my whole, like, whole undergrad was pottery. Um, and I would love to do that again. It was just, it was so fun. I love the whole process of, like, making the piece and then painting it and, um, I just, I just love that. I love working with my hands. I love painting and I don't get to do that very much. I don't make time to do that very much. Um, but it's an expensive, expensive hobby. So <laughs> <laughs> Noel, like have you, one. have you been to the Brambleton center? I know. Yes. And they have that. I have 
I've circled that class in the book several times. <laughs> because if once you take their classes, if you keep signing up, as long as you're always taking a class, you can, and you like have to buy clay from them. But aside from that, you can use all their tools. They will fire everything for you at no charge. Uh, My husband wow. did that Might for a while. That. Yeah. That's and there's amazing. lots of good teachers. And actually a lot of the classes are not even really classes. It's more like once you get through the beginning ones, people, it's just like studio time. So you just go and you throw pottery together and people will like give you advice if whether or not you want it. Um, <laughs> but it's like a social hour too. All right, so. Second question from our grab bag. What is your favorite season of the year and why is it your All favorite right. season? That's an easy one. So. Um, spring because I just I love the weather after you know it's like winter you're stuck in the house and it's cold and then spring is just like all the flowers come out and the grass is green and the smell of the air um, it's just so refreshing and um, I love to be outside I just feel it makes you feel kind of like grounded and peaceful and better, <laughs> so, better than winter. Um, <laughs> so definitely spring. Awesome. Me too. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Thank you. Noelle, you're a gem of the human being. Oh, you're too nice. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, we've really enjoyed being with you today. Thank you so much for all of your words of wisdom and um, a little glimpse into music therapy. So let me ask you this with your children's book, uh, where can people find that? Is it just on Amazon? Um, it's on Amazon. Yeah. Just on Amazon. Well, no, I, I can't remember. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So you can get I think it's, Amazon. I think it's anywhere books are sold, um, but Amazon's the main, main place. Got it. And if people are interested or something has piqued their interest by listening to this interview and want to know more about music therapy or in particular your, um, your business here on Roanoke and the services you offer, where can they go? Yeah, they can head to um, the letter A, musictherapy.com. And there's a ton of information there, but um, if they wanted to contact me directly, they can contact me at my email, which is noelle at amusictherapy.com. Wonderful. And we'll put links below so people awesome. can just click those and, and get all the information they need. <laughs> Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it so much. And we'll talk soon.